Ken. We'll start in just a moment. Hello, and welcome to the Zucare Gallery's MFA Salon Artist Talk. I'm Karen Levitov, Director and Curator of the Paul W. Zucare Gallery, and I'm pleased to welcome you to hear from the artists in the exhibition for MFA Thesis Exhibition 2021. The exhibition presents new works by four graduating Master of Fine Arts students at Stony Brook University's Art Department. The exhibition is on view at the Zucare Gallery, which is located on the first floor of the Stoller Center for the Arts, through Friday, April 16th, from 12 to 2 p.m. and by appointment. For today's talk, we'll hear from each of the four artists. Questions can be typed in the Q&A box on your screen. The program will be recorded and will be available on the Zucare Gallery website. And now, please welcome our first speaker, Stuart Balius. Stuart, you can unmute and begin. Stuart, yeah. you want to go ahead? Sorry. Yeah, I'm getting there. Can okay. you uh, can you see that? Not yet. It's but it's starting. Now we can, can you see it. it now. Yeah, like Karen said, my name's Stuart Bailius. Uh, this is my part of the show in Zucare. Um, when I was starting to contemplate what I wanted to focus on, I decided to go back to the Pittsburgh area where I lived for 20 years and go to these areas that were places of environmental degradation. Um, I've been really interested in that since I've gotten here, I was always interested in ecology, and that's what I've been focusing mainly on. So I went back to the Pittsburgh area, and I went to several locations to uh, do archaeological digs and to do surveys of the areas. So here's me doing a archaeological dig behind my parents' house. Oh, by the way, I actually, I. I got my undergraduate degree in anthropology, archaeology track, and I worked as a field archeologist briefly. <laughs> um, so I've had training in it and I did it professionally. So these are some images from behind my parents' house. Um, I knew where there was a midden heap behind my parents' house because me and my brother have picked pieces of glass and bottles out from back there. So I decided to start my dig behind there where I knew this spot was. And this is some of the stuff that I found. You can see like pieces of shoe, bottles, um, piece of a comb. All of it's pretty much from the 20s until the 60s. The latest stamp I found on any of the glass was I think 62. Um, this is the screen that I used for the dig. And I replaced the uh, PVC piping with um, metal and I painted it so that it looked like it was rotting, like it was just left out in the world. Close up. So the first place that I went to do a survey was the Westmoreland Glass Company in Jeanette, Pennsylvania, which is about two miles from where I live. Um, here's a picture of it from uh, the like 20s or 30s. It was an operation from I think it was 1910 until the 70s. Another one. There it is in the 80s. This is the stuff that they made there. They did these really ornate glassware um, products. They were real famous for their milk glass. There it is now-ish. <laughs> There's the uh, stuff that I collected from the site, which is almost all milk glass. Um, next place I went was the McGee Mine, um, which is about like 10 miles from where I lived. Um, it was in operation around the same time. Uh, it didn't last as long though. I think it shut down like in the like 30s. Um, it was a huge operation. 
most of the buildings were made out of stone. There it is now. And here's what I collected from it. Um, this is essentially slate dump um, with some coal in it. Um, they leave these piles like everywhere, like in the area. It's like the residue from the mining industry, which brings me to the show show. Um, these are paintings I was that I made for the show. You can sort of get like a feel for how everything's laid out. Um, I encourage anyone who can to come and like check out the show. So the first piece I'm gonna talk about is uh, my Wastelvania painting, which is an all white painting that I made to have a movie that I filmed um, of me doing um, all the things that I showed, uh, me doing the dig and me going and surveying the different locales. Here's the painting with the movie projected on it. There's a close up so you can get an idea of the texture. Um, so the painting was supposed to show sort of a one by one unit, um, the entrance to the mine, spilling out the entrance to the factory, everything spilling out into the greater community. Um, so here's some photographs that I took from the movie. This is me going into uh, Westmoreland Glassworks, some of the stuff I found. So this is also taken from the movie. Uh, this is uh, acid mine runoff, a polluted stream. Uh, this is the type of muck and mire that comes off of all these slate dumps. And all of that flows directly into Swickley Creek, which eventually makes it to the Monongahela, which eventually makes it to the Ohio, to the Mississippi, to the Gulf of Mexico. There's some other stuff from the Mickey Mine. People use it as a trash dump. Um, you see someone dump like a ton of tires. This is actually inside one of the buildings. And uh, here's a um, shrine that someone put in one of the other buildings. So I'm assuming someone died there. So here's the first painting that I did, um, called it Moldering Brick. It's supposed to be, you know, sort of the crumbling infrastructure, the, uh, you know, loss of industry. Here's a close up. Oil in the estuary. Um, I'm very conscious of every oil spill and gas leak. It all eventually flows into the rivers, into the bays, into, uh, into our waterways. Um, so that's what it's supposed to be, like sort of like an overtop um, mapping of essentially of it. There's a close up. So this one's called Dust to Dust. It's sort of supposed to be sort of like the crumbling of the factory wall, um, oozing out, you know, water sinking into the into the walls and pouring out through the cracks. It's close up. So this one was, I was thinking about mapping um, and I was thinking about, you know, I, I kept seeing these pieces of plywood, you know, just sort of left in like a corner and, you know, mossy and splintering up. So that's what it's supposed to be, of sort of the wood and the sheet metal just sort of crumble and, you know, being taken over by this lichen. Let's close up. And this one's called McGee's Prophets. This one's supposed to be, you know, a seam of coal, a stream of coal. Um, it, it was the lifeblood of the community. So I was thinking about the importance of these places and what was left in the wake and how little it profited the people that were there. There's a close up. This one is called Unnamed Tributary. I was thinking about the acid mine stream and Swickley Creek and how interconnected it is. And it wanted to be like a stream going through one of these slate dumps. 
And I was also thinking about Pittsburgh and Three Rivers, right? So it's the Monongahela, the Allegheny, and the Ohio. And here's the last part of uh, the installation, I guess you would call it. Um, this is the debris from my studio floor for me making all my paintings and prints, which takes me to the collagraphs. So I made these with their white house paints and gravel um, um, poured onto like metal plates so that I get this heavy embossment to the prints. The close up scene sort of get a little bit of the texture. And they're all supposed to be the same thing, sort of like the spilling out of all this stuff into, you know, the environment, into people's lives. You know, sort of leaking out, spilling out, collapsing out. The erosion of everything. Everything returns to you know the dust eventually. So that's my spiel. Um, so Karen, do you want me to stop sharing or do you want me to go back through stuff? Just open it up to questions. We can open it up to questions. If anybody has a question to type into the Q&A, that would be great. Let's see. We don't have any questions at the moment. Stuart, do you want to um, talk a little bit more about your technique? Are your prints unique or are they in addition? Um, they are unique, but I could make them an addition. Um, it's more about me like experimenting with the color more than anything else. Um, if I was to do it as an addition, and I'd probably just do it, you know, pure black and white. Okay, but great. technically, I guess I could, but like trying to match those colors, and they pretty much devour the ink. So. It, it, would, it would be an undertaking trying to do like a like you know that colorful uh, print and making an addition. Okay, great. We have one question um, from Toby Bonagario. Stuart, do you feel this is an ongoing theme of your work after graduation? Um, absolutely. Hi, Toby. By the way, um, yeah, I, I'm going to continue doing the same type of deal. Um, you know, it's it's evolved throughout, so I'm not sure if it's going to be the exact same. I, I really like the process that I, I've gotten to, and I've gotten to the point now where I know what the material is going to be doing. Um, when I first got here, you know, I started experimenting, trying to do these um, heavily textured paintings and prints, and now I feel like I've finally gotten a handle on how to make what I had in my head. Yeah. Great. We have a couple more questions. Uh, Isak Burvik is asking about your experimentation with materials in the studio, uh, in particular, your use of non-art material. Yeah, uh, part of its practicality, um, I, I tend to use construction grade stuff. Uh, I also um, started fiddling around mixing in, like I, I put um, some of the acid mine stream and the painting about that, and I put like the slate, pretty much all of them. Uh, and yeah, I mean, cost, it's cost effective and, you know, I get the results that I want and I don't break the bank, yeah. Great. Uh, and Jennifer Larson um, so, says, so well, uh, sorry, so well motivated and deep. I'm curious about your feelings about the role of the artist in society. Uh, I think that, you know, we re reflect what, we're living in for sure. And I think that, you know, our role is to, essentially it is to, you know, express our feelings on those things. Uh, not that, you know, people have to be motivated for a cause, but like anything you do is gonna reflect your feelings on things. I think that answer, that answer that question. Um, yeah, I think so. And Jennifer, thank you so much <laughs> for joining us.
uh, Kathleen Fenton is asked saying, congratulations. How do you think um, to project your, oh, how did you think to project your film onto a painting? Do you think you'll continue using projections? Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, it was the first film that I made, movie, uh, video. Uh, um, it, it was an experiment. Um, I got the idea, I made the movie first as like another project and then I got the idea to do it this way. Uh, I wanted it to be like this reticulated, um, twisted uh, image of what I had filmed. So I, I, you know, I had this specific idea that I wanted it to be this one by one unit and I wanted to have all this texture and have like visible stuff spilling out of it. Um, I, I like how it turned out. Um, as far as trying it again, I probably will do some things, but I, I don't know how much I would focus on it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Stuart. Thank you. I, uh, next, we have uh, Marta Baummiller. Marta? Yes, here I am. Hi. Um, let's do it. Let me see if I can get this thing going. Okay. Um, yeah, hi everyone. So, uh, uh, my name is, uh, yes, you know my name, Marta. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I thought I would talk about this past year uh, instead of just focusing on the piece in the gallery because um, it's been such a year. And um, I, I work in a variety of media, um, kind of diverse body of work. Um, most of it is not very easily classified maybe as sculpture or painting or, uh, but I do make objects and I, and I, um, and I want people to interact with them. Um, I like the process of making very much. It, it allows me to, to think. So I tend to use these labor intensive um, techniques, uh, some associated with maybe women's work, things like weaving and sewing and crocheting. Um, I tried to use them in not very traditional ways. Um, my interests generally, you know, they range from repurposing and sustainability to functionality, community, politics. Uh, um, I still believe in these utopian ideas of, of empowering people and trying to create uh, some kind of a horizontal space um, through these art encounters. Um, this year, um, because of our sort of social and political experience, uh, you know, my, uh, my art, I feel, has been overshadowed uh, by, it's become even more about empathy and community and making uh, art that is just making art essential. So let me now share my screen if I'm able to. And uh, I do have a few videos later on in this presentation. I hope they uh, will work. And if not, we'll muddle through. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I'm, um, there we go. Can, everybody can see that, I hope. Uh, view present. Can you see that? I uh, can't see anyone, so yes. Um, I'll just start. I'll assume yes. Yeah, Marta, we can see it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Um, okay, so um, so about a year ago, exactly, um, in terms of uh, like last March and April, I started to make masks. I had collected um, tons of fabric over the years, and um, I had sewing machines. It seemed the most natural way to repurpose, engage, and and help. Uh, you know, feeling less useless. Um, I made quite a few, giving uh, many away to friends and, and family, local healthcare workers. I asked people to send me selfies. So um, here they are, the first month or two. Soon everyone was making masks and it wasn't such a dire need. So I, I sort of uh, transitioned. I got more specific and made some, designed some masks for the BLM marches, I gave them away there, made a lot of friends. Um, and so uh, it was getting warm and we were still in lockdown at the time. And I, um, 
I, I, I don't know, we were still not able to be together. So I planned these distancing blankets, socially distanced blankets. I had, uh, I had been experimenting with umbrellas and as shelters and places for people to gather. And so uh, the picnic blanket was next. Here's one where she's jumping for joy, but protected. And here is an actual one with the ribbons used to delineate the distance. Um, I, here's another prototype. I'm actually sewing outdoors here. I didn't have enough floor space. Um, and here are some picnickers putting it to good use. So um, now it seems like um, in the fall, the situation was getting worse. And, lots of social upheaval and I was reading um, about the best way to predict the future is to invent it so I began to think about social contracts and I thought I would experiment with this idea of bartering and I um, designed this um, sort of interactive exhibit for the alloway um, to um, the idea of exchange without the use of money. Um, I had the great opportunity to use the ceramic studio and I taught myself a little bit about throwing and I experimented with glazes, all these tactile processes that I needed to survive. <laughs> and uh, I made about a hundred vessels and, um, and I set them up in this exhibit at the Alloway um, to be uh, sort of bartered with the audience. I did make some drawings also of the bulls, which remained at the end of the show, even though most of the, uh, the ceramics were bartered. So the audience was really important to me. It's always really important. And so I, I did tempt quite a few viewers here um, in exchange for these handmade vessels. I received all kinds of barters of um, poetry, stories, drawings, artwork, uh, you know, exploring this idea of how we perceive creativity or what's handmade. Um, also, I think the exchange, that was the part that was enjoyed the most by everyone. It was the actual exchange. Um, so in the winter, I was uh, playing around with more of these ideas of exchange and ideas of materiality and physical objects and our attachments to them. So here I made a, a picnic basket. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a rolling, uh, a rolling sculpture with political roots. Um, um, referencing all these tiny libraries and food pantries that sort of pop up in our neighborhoods and um, uh, also, what are we really exchanging? I've made the interior reflective so you can see yourself uh, when you're looking in there. Um, and here it is in the winter time. I have not found a place to actually uh, use it in a social uh, sort of context. So I hope to do that um, soon. Um, so in the spring, um, we had been living in this sort of state of siege as I felt. Uh, and I wanted to mark the importance of the year because it felt like things were getting better and we were so drained all of us from and in need of replenishment. So for the final MFA show, um, I was still seeking this audience and contact and I decided to do a dual installation with uh, this one, Soul Bath being the outdoor component um, and I cited it at P-Lot, very significant place, this commuter parking lot with um, normally filled with thousands of cars, but now almost empty, um, physically sort of highlighting the current state of events. And um, it also is where the COVID testing takes place. Here's my proposed drawing for the intervention, the sort of sensory intervention. Um, I did collaborate with many uh, organizations at SBU, like the community services and mental health outreach groups, and the bus drivers, the transportation center there um, in the lot, who really, they helped me protect the sculpture um, from the wind. Um, 
by parking buses and using them as wind barriers. Um, uh, so here's a movie which I hope will work. Let's see if it does. Um, it's kind of raucous. So, um, you might want to turn down your sound. If it works. <laughs> did that. Um, so here it is. It's a, sort of a beacon of, uh, of light in this very gray surrounding. Uh, here's another interior shot of the flower garlands that were made from recycled plastic bags. Um, and some reflective um, elements extending sort of the color into the asphalt. Um, Oh gosh, another movie. I hope this works too. This is an, a, an actual drive that worked sort of so after eight days uh, the wind capsized this uh, shelter of of hope um a bit sooner than i'd hoped but um not that i wanted it to last but i uh but i had hoped that uh, enough people i don't think enough people got to see it and experience it so um but i like working with these impermanent uh, materials it, it it makes it all almost like a performance and so i i accept that um Okay, so now we come to the present piece on view at the Zucare, which is up for one more week. I hope you visit. Um, it's uh, another intervention, sort of a gate into a, a, another dimension, maybe. This is the model addressing the scale of the gallery and um, it's sort of reimagining a sensory shelter, standing up to the, to the fight with fearlessness. I, I was diving into materiality here. I picked these colors. They were the similar fabrics as to the, um, the rip, ripstop nylon that I used for the outdoor piece. Um, here I am, oh, well, I'm not here. This is a, um, in a piece of it, testing it. Uh, here I am wallowing in the, in the stuff. Yeah, it took 97 yards of fabric to, create the piece and we couldn't do it without the lift. What a wonderful invention to get us up to the 24th foot ceilings there. Um, 
looking up. Another side of it, interiors. Um, I, it created some nice sh subtle shadows that were colored. Somebody else looking up. Um, more shadows. Here it is from the top floor, the second floor looking down into it. That was really important for me to make it look inviting from up there. Um, yeah, here it is dancing. And I have one more film I have at the very end here. This is uh, kind of like a walkthrough. I hope it is. Oops, that's enough of that. <laughs> okay, we all have our drugs, and that's mine. Sorry about that. Thank you, Marta. Uh, wonderful. This, if anybody has questions, please type them into the Q and A box on your screen for Marta. Sorry, the music is still playing. Marta, I love how in the gallery there's a subtle air current that makes the uh, fabric move and and the shadows play and so it's really a beautiful subtle piece in the gallery you know it grabs you right away but then there's a certain kind of subtlety as well uh, we have a question from larry sims who asks why do you think impermanent materials and constructs uh, are effective at presenting and perhaps challenging durable and important ideas well i you know I, I just think about us and time and life and death and why pretend, <laughs> you know, things are changing so all the time and I think that's important to keep in mind all the time. Um, no matter what you're doing, you have to think of that. Of course, you know, I'm pretty old so I think about it a lot more <laughs> than a lot of people. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Um, Toby asks, uh, says, congratulations, Marta. Since this is a site specific work, will you repurpose the 97 yards of fabric into another work? And if it's its initial, uh, and if so, will its initial use impact any future works? Well, I wish somebody had a big tall gallery like the Zucare. That would be great. I would love to repurpose it for in another space. But uh, yes, I mean, I have that's what I, my studio is filled with bags of stuff that has been either taken apart pieces or pieces that are not built yet so of course it'll go back into its bag and at, at some point maybe something else will come up and i will try to repurpose it this was a, a substantial amount of fabric but it folds up quite small so it's good <laughs> Great. Um, Jennifer Larson is asking, uh, the fabric structure is pretty incredible. How re predetermined was this piece? Did you predetermine it more like an architect or drape and design as you went, like a sculptor? It was kind of a 
blend of both. Um, uh, I had to plan a chunk of it, but I, I always make things and test them. So I would, I, I, I had a picture of it um, in this, um, in the slideshow where it was just tested. I, I hung it in, the, in, in our barn to see how it would drape. And then I made some small adjustments, but, but I tried to uh, really plan things out beforehand with drawings and models as much as I can. The model was extremely helpful in this case because the scale is so oversized that it was hard to, I've never made anything that big. So I did have to uh, do a, an actual scaled model to figure out how much fabric I would need. And that helped. Yeah, that was great. But um, both ways a little. Yeah. And so like you said, you made the scale model. So you had it somewhat predetermined like an architect. And then yes. as we were as we were in the gallery and we had the people up on the lift, we had, you know, you made some adjustments as you went and designed it a bit in person as well. So I think yeah, yes, like you said, some there of were the many adjustments because it was a four person show. I couldn't just hog the whole space, although I wanted to, <laughs> I, I, I had to make room for, for sight lines and, uh, and kind of compact it a little bit more uh, within the space. To give yes. Me. Okay, last question then, I believe. Um, actually, we have a couple, let me see if I can, we'll do them quickly. Um, so Isak is asking if uh, you can talk about some of the specific contexts, audiences or audience participants either actual or ideal or ideal participants and with site intervention and the social work of art, the ways in which exchange, communication, empathy and community become the medium for various aesthetic or ritual activities to unfold, as well as the ways in which site, architectural, landscape, geographical becomes the field. It's not an easy question to answer shortly, but. <laughs> I'm not exactly so sure what about the question the is, but I it's good. About, yeah, the context and audience. Yeah, it's hugely important. I mean, I design everything with that in mind and it's been really a huge challenge. That's why I made this all about this year because I feel like I've been trying to do different things, but it's really hard. There's no one anywhere. It's so difficult to actually find ways to engage people. And that's why I thought of the outdoor piece because I thought, well, people feel safe in their car, so maybe they will come. But that you have to advance. You have to give people notice, like months notice, that they are going to do this because if it's something is only open for a very short time, I learned that you really have to allow people time. They don't just show up. People don't think that way. They're not as spur of the moment as that, especially now. So um, yeah, yeah, it's a huge thing. Great. Um, Joe Santarpia uh, says, congratulations, Marta. And maybe we could answer this at the end if we have time, but um, he's asking about any projects or public art experiences planned for the future. So maybe you can think about that. He says he's very excited to see what comes next. Oh, somebody um, wants me to do a, a uh, <laughs> wait, what is that? It's a music festival <laughs> uh, uh, for the people, the, uh, it's not a group that I'm familiar with, but everybody knows them. Uh, Grateful Dead, right? <laughs> uh, okay. yes, there's a music festival, and I, they they want to do the drive-through there. I thought that why not? It's kind okay. of like my drug. It could be that somebody's experience uh, with music. Yeah. Great. All right. Good. Well, thank you very much, Marta. That was wonderful. Um, now we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Ifi Chang. Ifi. Ifi. Hello everyone. Hi, now uh, I cannot share my uh, screen. Yeah, present. Uh, hello, my name is Yifei Chen. I'm a third year MFA student. Uh, today I'm gonna give a artist talk, which is about the uh, three years uh, what I learned here and also what projects have been done and uh, uh, give a short introduction about my background and also uh, I will introduce my piece uh, in the Zucker Gallery definitely yeah and here is my website yeah if you're interested with my work you can go to my website to take a look here 
Uh, this piece uh, called the happiness one, uh, which is my favorite piece uh, during the first year here. Uh, so um, being uh, being separate with my families in the United States and uh, being alone in the uh, Stony Brook, which makes me a little bit anxiety and also a little bit nervous. Um, so during the first year, I kind of deal with this separation and love. Um, so during the first year, uh, every time I enter my studio, I can see a bright yellow block in front of my studio, which makes me really happy and uh, uh, kind of forgot the separation with my family. So the feelings, bad feelings, yeah. And uh, I begin to use a uh, bright yellow color to produce uh, photography, uh, which is kind of a uh, healing process for me. Uh, which is really peaceful in my mind. Yeah, so I really love the uh, bright yellow color and the process of it. So I made the uh, organic shapes uh, and the photograph them and put them together. So I made the happiness series. This one is called happiness one and the, this one is happiness six and this one is happiness seven. Yeah, as you can see, uh, the shapes are all dynamic and uh, and the organic and I put them together means like I wanted to see the flow about them like to put them together like this how they change from one to to another yeah and uh, during the uh, 2019 the, the second year of my MFA program here uh, I got a call from my father during the spring break uh, both my uh, grandfather from my father's side and uh, my grandmother from my mother's side, they are sick in the hospital and uh, uh, which makes me really sad and, uh, um, and feel the distance with uh, elder people. Um, yeah, because my grandfather has last stage lung cancer and uh, my grandmother uh, broke her hip and after surgery, she cannot work anymore. The news made me really sad since I have been, been studying uh, in the United States for almost nine years. I only can go back to China to see my grandparents very, every summer. Uh, even I try to FaceTime with them, they are too old to learn how to use phones. So I only can FaceTime with them when my parents are within them. Um, because of some physical issues, I only can face them with them uh, one time per semester or two. Uh, I now feel strongly that elderly people are getting old too fast. Uh, situations like mine are becoming more common as more and more people go overseas for studying and working. Uh, I'm now trying to face time with the elder uh, since I learned that grandfather only has a few days left during the 2019s. Uh, meanwhile, I have to concentrate my, on my studies in the U US, uh, which has been very difficult for me. Uh, and the, during every time I FaceTime with them, I screenshot uh, the images. And uh, after I can go back to China during the May, uh, I stack the uh, uh, screenshots together and made this photo and made these photos. Uh, yeah, these photos kind of uh, a sad and the uh, and the uh, a documentary photo for me, uh, which document the uh, um, specific timing for me and my families. Um, also, I really love this uh, uh, photos because uh, this time I used a new way which called screenshots to produce photography, which kind of new for me. And also I want to explore this uh, method or process uh, in the future. So now coming to uh, 2021, which is uh, this year's called the wall. Um, it's placing in the 
uh, Zucker Gallery now. Uh, it has their self photography that uh, uh, I screenshot the uh, uh, video chat uh, from me and my families. Um, also, I put a speaker every two images, or uh, in between every two images, because uh, this uh, speaker is an audio uh, which played the uh, video chat the sound between me and my mother. And uh, during the uh, the last uh, PowerPoint, I will play the uh, audio for you. So now I want to uh, explain or introduce this series to you. Um, as you can see, like every image, I have a um, Chinese text here on the top of the image or on the side of the image, uh, which, uh, which explains what we um, were planned before the pandemic and the, the planning for uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, like for example, uh, the image I wrote on my um, uh, mothers here, I said like during, uh, before the pandemic, we planned for the 2021 was uh, my, mother and father come to the United States and spend the spring festival with us. Uh, uh, in February and March 2021. Yeah, and uh, they, uh, they will stay here until the May. And uh, we spend, uh, uh, we are gathering to celebrate my graduation ceremony. Uh, together, then they back to China. They fly back to China, yeah. And uh, but the pandemic stopped our plan, and uh, uh, we only can gather through the the phone and the uh, video chat to each others and uh, celebrate the spring festivals and also my uh, graduation ceremony, yeah. And like this one. Uh, I face uh, a video chat with my uh, grandmother. Uh, she seems so happy. And uh, after my grandfather died, she uh, she lived with my aunt together. And uh, my aunt take care of her so well. And uh, she seems like, oh, like how 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 are you? How uh, when can you come back to China to visit me? Like ask that, and uh, this one, as you can see, she holds the same uh, toothpick holder with me because she gave the her toothpick holder to me and uh, says, uh, "Let the toothpick holder go with you uh, wherever where wherever you go, and uh, just uh, as me accompany with you uh, together." Yeah, so. Uh, now the toothpick holder with me in the New York and uh, in the Stony Brook and in the uh, Seattle right now. Yeah, and she says, she says, she showed me uh, her new toothpick holder says, yeah, you see, I give, I give you mine and I got a new one here. Yeah, so like toothpick holder um, is a so common decoration in the Chinese families and uh, uh, it made, from plastic and uh, it's lightweight and uh, easy to carry, uh, and also it's it's mm, it's uh, cheap. Uh, it's like one dollars, uh, around one dollars each, like that. Yeah, and uh, she says, um, she's not that mean to give me the toothpick holder. I think she's mean to give me something like, uh, can get along with me together all the time. Yeah. And I won't explain every uh, image to you uh, because you can uh, um, go through these images one by one in the online. And uh, in the end, I will give you a, um, uh, a, a website, which is our the four um, online show. And for example, this one during me and my mom chat, uh, I show her my uh, new paint nails, which is red color. 
um, because uh, red uh, color for Chinese, this means lucky. And uh, as I said to her, you see, I have red colors, which means the, the future year I will be lucky. And she says, oh, young girls should paint their nails and, uh, and, uh, and uh, put makeup because I, during the pandemic, I've been like one, more than one year, I didn't put makeup on my face. So when she saw my nails, she said, she says, she seems so happy. Like she's so uh, appreciated that nail color and the, uh, and that you can see like she's more have like tearing in her eyes. Yeah. And this one is uh, with FaceTime with my mother and uh, she was in my grandmother's home. Um, my grandmother is not that um, um, healthy. So she need to put her uh, mask all the time during she chat with my grandmother. Yeah, and this one is uh, me and my uh, aunt. Uh, she just uh, got back in that day and uh, after she hear, heard my voice and says, oh, it's Ife and uh, we need to chat. And uh, yeah, because after the first vaccine, uh, she felt so tired and, uh, and uh, yeah, but she, she, she keep asking, oh, how are you? And when can you come back? And I miss you a lot, yeah. Because during uh, when I was a kid, I spent lots of time with my aunt and my grandmother. So we have had a deep relationship between each other uh, more than just the relatives. Yeah, this one is my husband FaceTime with her, with his mother. As you can see, uh, the red paper cut is on the uh, window, uh, which we used to put it during the spring festivals. And as you can see, her dress a, a red pajama here. And yeah, which means she's gonna be lucky in the future year, yeah. And this one is me and my father. Uh, every time I video chat with my father, he hold a, a cigarette. And uh, I said, don't do not do cigarette anymore. And uh, he said, it's, uh, it's a, a great period during the festivals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, so like annoying to me that he always hold a cigarette. And this one is me and my grandmother from my father's side. Uh, she, during the video chat, she keep rubbing the uh, screen touch, uh, the touch screen, because she thought uh, if she touched the screen, she can touch me. So she keep rubbing it and uh, says, oh, I, I miss you a lot. How are you? Like, uh, how, like, when, yeah, when can you come back to China to visit me? Like every, our elders are, ask me the same question. Yeah. Um, yeah, the audio is here. And uh, this website is from the Zucker Gallery. You can, uh, uh, you can read our uh, text and uh, images here also. And when you scroll down here, you can hear the Hello, yeah. uh, I won't play all the audio for you because it's like 15 minutes now. I will just uh, uh, play a few clips for you. Yeah, the mean to play this audio is um, to let the audience feel the happiness and the positive emotions between me and my mother. And uh, the volume I played in the uh, Zucker Gallery, which is a low volume, uh, which I wanted the audience feel the intimacy and, uh, and uh, the soft voice between uh, families. Yeah, that that's all. That's all the stuff that I want to show you. Thank you, Ife. That was wonderful. Uh, if anybody has questions for Ife, you can put them in the Q and A box.
think the um, the photographs with the audio in the gallery have been uh, really wonderful and people are definitely interested in them and everyone can relate to that during this time. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank you, Carrie and Georgia, uh, to put all my stuff on the wall. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, great. We will move on now to our last speaker for today, who is Anne Marie Wa. Anne Marie. Hi, everyone. Um, so I thought for this presentation, I do a bit of MFA nostalgia, and I would take you through all the work I've done over the three years. Um, so I make paintings, I write poems and stories, and I make little artist videos and little sculptures. And mostly I seem to have an environmental theme that runs through my work. And I always try to find humor, although as you know, it's hard to find that in environmental issues. Um, so I began the program um, writing a story about the gossiping flowers and animals in my garden. Um, the ferns are the main characters and they kind of complain about the dog peeing on them and the neighbors spraying pesticides. Um, so I dug up ferns from my garden, put them in these wood pallets and I painted um, with soil um, the characters. There was also quite a bit of care and maintenance involved. Um, with taking ferns and different plants inside. And so I was constantly watering them, but they died very quickly. But I was very interested and I still am in how um, plants really boost your mood and improve your concentration and productivity. Um, that became a installation at the Patchahoke Art Center, which is a wonderful gallery. If you get a chance, go there. Um, they always have some really great shows. Um, here I created felt pockets and I planted um, the ferns in soil and rhododendrons and they were all around the different heights on the wall. Oh, and I should say I recorded the story and that was embedded maybe waist level into one of the pockets. So viewers had to crouch to hear the story. and. The story was also embedded in the previous um, image you saw of the wood pallet, so you would bend down to hear the story. So it's kind of, I'm always interested in the view of nature. I boiled up some soil and created like a soil tempura paint, and I also painted with grass. And here I wrote the story out in soil, and this is Mrs. Bunny, one of the main characters in the piece. Um, and a close-up of the texture, the great textures you get with soil. Um, my next project, I decided that I didn't really care for many of my paintings, that they worked better cut up. So I wrote a poem about the process of making art and um, I cut out all these great textured, um, colorful letters and I made them into a poem. Um, I also created large panels of chalk with, um, with the poem written out in chalk. Um, it really talked about the process of, you know, what you do in order to create art. And here you see the canvas kind of curled up and rolled. So um, that's the whole poem as a digital piece. There you see the two panels um, where I'm um, experimenting with the poem. So I breathed it, slapped it. And in the end, even the dog got sick, but nothing good ever came of it. Um, I created a floor decal so you could walk over the poem. This was another project about nail biting and the chemicals in um, nail polishes. And I've been reading about the, um, the New York Times journalist who investigated the nail salons, and I guess that was in my head. So I created these characters. Here you see Endochrome Disruptor. Um, she's in nail polish. Um, 
on an acrylic sheeting. I'm very drawn to very graphic images as well as a lot of color and layers. And here you see the poem. I actually wrote out the poem on six panels in nail polish, which was kind of stinky in my studio. Um, this is the phallite family and this is for maldehyde. So initially you're there kind of humorous and very graphic, but underneath it all, their toxic chemicals. And here are some experiments with um, implements from nail polish, decals, etc. And then another one. Um, this was another project. Um, it was a poem I wrote about monarch butterflies. And I created, I wrote the poem out and I had little pouches of um, seeds that viewers could take. Um, I actually read the poem out and I created um, alf the alphabet um, with milkweed embedded in soil. And I also created um, the alphabet with just the milkweed seeds and the beautiful flowers. I did a whole photo shoot with that. This was the next project I worked on, Beautiful Sweet Object Poem, which was also um, based on a poem, um, The American Dream Tethered to Tooth Decay. And I wrote this out in chocolate. Um, this is dark chocolate. I had milk chocolate and white chocolate. And here you see, this was actually in the Tabla Gallery. This, I used dum-dums and I used pink food dye to um, work on the uh, pedestal. And on the wall was the projected video. And I created an avatar of myself where I read the e poem, um, but I won't play this. E it might horrify some people to go back to that memory. And um, I had these little stickers as well that I created, but the whole uh, film the animation builds up into this burst of color. Um, this was uh, my solo show at the Alloway Gallery and it was titled Shucked. I really like the um, rhyming possibilities of that. Here on the first wall, you see pitch pine emoji um, and you, would, you could call the number. This is a sand piece and here, the pitch pine story, which sadly is the chainsaw. So when you call the number, it was the chainsaw. And I actually recorded that on my own phone and people called me without knowing about this and wondered why they were hearing chainsaws. So I got a lot of interesting comments from friends about that. Um, in the show, uh, the whole show was really about the decline of the Peconic uh, Bay Scallop. They had all died off um, last year by 90% because of um, rising water temperatures and they found a parasite in the kidney of them. Basically, I wrote a story about this uh, fashionista called Lolo who, um, Lulu, I'm sorry, who goes to a restaurant trying to order peconic based scallops and not understanding why she can't get any. Um, viewers could sit on the bench and contemplate the antique scallop dread while they listened, dredge while they listened to the story um, about Lulu and how she thinks that the restaurant's saving them for some celebrity bash. Um, also in the show were my um, paintings, some found objects. Um, another wall contained a painting of the scallop dredge pattern, which is, I turned upside down and it was called me being a scallop. And I um, provided some props um, like this plush Nemo toy, the last fish, if we don't stop uh, eating and killing all the fish. Um, and so audience could play around with that. And, Students and people who came to see the show had fun doing so and then posted selfies. This was a small sculpture, boom or burst, um, that I created with by saving all my plastic uh, milk lids and some tomato uh, containers, which you probably recognize. Here are some more um, little sculptures of antique fishing lures. 
and um, big pieces of shells dipped in plastic. There was, already, there was also a wall of historic photographs showing you know, how large the fish used to be. And now today they're even less than quarter of the size, which is really sad. Um, so art in the pandemic, pandemic um, <laughs> I worked on this project called A Wishful Gesture. It was a peaceful installation of three village communities support for black lives and unity in our nation. This was a project I collaborated with Tali Hinkus of Lovid and Gallery North. We invited the local community to share wishes of love, peace and hope by placing plants, drawings, sculptures and messages around the wish bone sculpture at Gallery North. And this was a wonderful outpouring of um, beautiful arts and flowers and plants. And it was up for two weeks at Gallery North. Um, I also, as you can see from my background, I work with plastic lids. I'm always saving all my plastic. And so I've been writing stories about how this, um, plastic lid has lost her other half and how she's she used to contain parmesan cheese and her friend here is crying because she used to contain goat cheese and um, they've both lost their other half and they're both cheesy I'm not going to even play that video and um, another project um, that I did for my next Alloway solo show was I had a food drive at Stop and Shop and I printed up this flat, uh, flyer for um, people going into the store, things that they should buy, which um, I worked with Long Island Cares and the Stony Brook Food Pantry and um, used what they wish to get. Um, so here um, uh, you see the food drive. And again, it was outside Stop and Shop we started with nothing and we ended up with so much food and maybe 300 or more dollars in cash, which we turned into gift cards. It was an amazing um, experience and it really was an outpouring from the community. Here after the um, food drive, I took it all to Long Island Cares. And then in the gallery, I had, this is, the poster that was set up at the gallery. I had the documentation on the walls um, from the Long Island Cares and I did keep a few of the cans and I also had a collection box outside of the gallery which kept being fill up, filled up even though it was during COVID. And actually I, this show was supposed to hang a week before but I had to quarantine because I'd been exposed. Um, the in the gallery, I created a pyramid with the cans and viewers were, um, they could take a label. I actually, I should explain this. Yeah, I created all these food labels of British foods, foods that I had grown up with. And it's a very graphic, colorful um, label. Viewers could select a label wrap it around their can and either put it on the shelf or add it to the pyramid. Here's the shelf. That's um, the poster explaining what to do. And on the back wall, there were some paper plates with more British expressions. So it was a serious need issue and I chose to bring it into the gallery as an art piece and I made it feel colorful and bright with these British expressions, some more views. And then at the end of the show, I donated all the cans and there were five big carts full to the Stony Brook Food Pantry and they were very happy. Um, for the Zucar Gallery, um, I, worked on a series of works about the fragility of the forest. And again, during COVID, everyone wants to escape and walking in the woods has always been my escape. At the same time, I noticed that the last few wooded acres around where I live were being cut down. 
and seemingly overnight a new McMansion appeared. And this really has been causing me to think how quickly na um, nature is disappearing, how easy it is to cut down a tree in no time. I wrote a poem which takes on a visual kind of tree stump. And I use many of the lines of the poem for the titles of the pieces in the show. This is the largest painting and I really like this shot of um, hanging the show. This painting, uh, two of the paintings are have canvas backs and they kind of screen off the painting with, I worked with bark paper, this um, pre-Columbian beautiful um, made in Mexico from the Amati tree and I've woven in plastic construction materials and screened, used it to kind of screen off the painting. They are intuitive paintings um, and I, as I said, I'm really drawn to colour and texture and layering and as you weave into this beautiful paper, the bark starts to break off and it has done in places. And I did paint the whole back black and maybe I haven't destroyed it enough. Um, this is an installation shot showing there are various sizes in the gallery, some of smaller pieces as well. Um, this is a close up where you can see up the caution tape woven through and seeping black paint from the background coming through to really mess with this beautiful um, bark paper. Um, the trees are a social network. This is the largest piece and it's backed. This one is not backed on canvas, but it's backed on a blue tarp. Mouse's tail and home wrecker. Mouse's tail has the little tail of flagging tape. And it's, I restricted my palette to only black and white in this piece. And this is a piece that is, um, I found this, or the orange plastic screening material kind of resembles the plastic version of my beautiful bark paper. So in this piece, I actually used acorns as a graphic element in the holes, but it's kind of reverse, the reversal of the bark. So plastic is taking over the nature here, whereas the other ones, the bark is kind of taking over the plastic. And as part of the show, I worked on these small sculptures. This one is Barking Mad. And I kind of think of this one as a self-portrait um, with a real oak bark. Um, oh, I'm going back to a smaller painting here. Some, this painting actually has text painted on. And I did a lot of experimenting with how to integrate the poem. And in that one, it's the most obvious. On the back wall of the gallery, um, I made a video using the poem and I'll play a little bit of that now. Um, basically, it has this yellow caution tape which um, goes across the middle and I set up a camera in my, um, I have a friend who lives in very rural Connecticut, Connecticut on the edge of a forest we set up a motion camera and you hear the foxes, coyotes, possums, they are, they, they're featured in the, po in the video. And um, sorry, you can hear my dog whining in the background. Um, this is in the gallery, how I set up the small sculptures on this uh, sawhorse table. Uh, with the poem on the very back wall. And this was my favorite piece from the show, Buried Treasure, holly berries surrounded in concrete with house paint. And Ivy League is a floor piece also in the gallery, a kind of play on Harvard and Yale versus Stony Brook. And Burr, um, 
somebody brought to my house some time ago one of those chocolates in the Frere Rocher chocolates in a plastic tray. I love those chocolates, but it's too much plastic. And I kept the tray and I thought the burrs really fit nicely in, in the tray. So it became a man-made kind of plastic nature sculpture. Um, and then I just thought I'd show you something I'm working on now. Um, I'm doing a whole um, tr set of tree emojis and this is Holly. And she is a work in pro progress, as I said. And I'm going to be, ri I'm writing a story and I intend to do maple, oak, birch, red, cedar, all the trees from the north, um, the east coast of America. And this is also a, another current piece that I'm working on. I got from a yard sale this beautiful uh, scale. And here you see plastic weighed down by this beautiful seahorse, which I was lucky enough to find on the beach a couple of weeks ago in Hampton Bays. And I was going to call this scales of justice, but I realized that seahorses don't have scales, they actually have skin. So this piece is called skin of justice. And I will probably find a fish and do use that for scales of justice. But uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne-Marie, that was wonderful. Um, we have a question from Isak. Uh, how do you approach starting projects, coming to it with activist causes in mind first, and then the art unfolds, or with the art problems in the studio first, or are they simultaneous perhaps? In other words, how do you start? Um, I usually start by, you know, reading or, you know, um, words actually, and then I kind of, delve into what sort of, um, after doing the research, what would make most sense. Okay, great. Uh, and Toby asks, says, congratulations, Anne-Marie. Uh, great seeing all your work again and your wonderful titles. <laughs> Thank so, you. More of a comment. Uh, other questions? Let's see. Um, Anybody have any questions for any of the four? Okay, then I think we will uh, wrap up the program there. So thank you very much to all of our artist speakers and to Georgia Lemaire behind the scenes. Um, thank you also to um, our audience for attending and, let's see, sorry. Um, and we hope to see you again at another Zucare Gallery event. And we do have this exhibition online at zucaregallery.stonybrook.edu. Um, and, the, uh, and there's a link there to the specific for um, exhibition website as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>